Hello everybody and welcome to chapter 3. We're going to talk about um, an understanding of the balance sheet and some financial disclosures and to see how this is useful to decision makers. So the purpose of the balance sheet, sometimes referred to as the statement of financial position, is to report a company's financial position on a particular date and time. I like to call it, it's a snapshot. Think of when you take a picture. A lot can happen before and a lot can happen after, but that picture records just a snapshot in time. The balance sheet presents an organized list of assets, of liabilities and shareholders' equity at a certain point in time. So it's like a freeze frame or a snapshot of financial position at the end of a particular day marking the end of an accounting period. Now shown here in this slide is an example of the asset section of a balance sheet of Under Armour. These classifications with related disclosure notes help the balance sheet provide useful information to decision makers. We also call stakeholders. Now the consolidated balance sheet is part of the annual report that's filed with the Security and Exchange Commission since this is a public company. The report is available for download by the public at the sec.gov. Here is the remaining two parts of the balance sheet of Under Armour, the liabilities and the stockholders equity or shareholders equity section, sometimes just talked about as stockholders equity. An important aspect of the balance sheet is that total assets always equal total liabilities plus the total shareholders' equity. Now the balance sheet with related disclosure not notes provides helpful information about liquidity and long-term solvency. Liquidity refers to the period of time before an asset gets converted to cash or until the liability is paid. The reason this is helpful because it helps assess the company's ability to pay its current obligations. Long-term solvency relates to the riskiness of a company with regard to the amount of liabilities in its capital structure. So all other things being equal, the risk to an investor or creditor gets bigger as the percentage of liabilities relative to the company's equity increases. Solvency also provides information about financial flexibility, which is the ability of a company to alter cash flows in order to take advantage of unexpected investment opportunities and needs. So like the higher the percentage of a company's liabilities to its equity, the more difficult it typically will be to borrow additional funds either to take advantage of an investment opportunity or to meet financial obligations. The less financial flexibility, there's a lot more risk that the enterprise could potentially fail. Now, one important limitation is that a company's book value, assets minus the liabilities, as shown in the balance sheet, usually will not directly measure the company's market value. Market value is the amount someone would be willing to pay to own the company. For a company with publicly traded stock, market value can easily be computed as the current stock price times the number of shares outstanding. The two primary reasons that a balance sheet doesn't portray the company's market value is that many assets are measured at their historical cost rather than their fair value. For example, if a company owns land and the value of that land has increased, well the increase in the value doesn't get reported in the balance sheet, but it's reflected in the market value. Also many aspects of a company may represent valuable resources like trained employees or an experienced management team or a really loyal customer base along with product knowledge. But these items don't get recorded in the assets of a balance sheet. Another limitation of the balance sheet's many items 
are heavily reliant on estimates and judgments rather than very determinable amounts. So even though the balance sheet does not directly measure the market value of a company, it does provide valuable information that's helped use to judge the market value. So this slide here um, shows the usefulness of the balance sheet that this usefulness gets enhanced when assets and liabilities get grouped together in common characteristics. This broad distinction made in the balance sheet is the current versus long-term classification of both assets and of liabilities. Now note here, shareholders equity shows two aspects the common stock, which we call the paid in capital, and the retained earnings, which comes from within the company. It's the net income that has been received since the inception of the company, minus any net losses, minus any dividends. So let's take a look at the a question regarding subclassifications for assets. So which of the following is a subclassification of assets on the balance sheet? Would it be cash and cash equivalents, revenue, current assets, or disposable assets? I hope you got this one right. We really separate our assets into current assets and into long-term assets. Now current assets include cash and other assets which are reasonably expected to get converted to cash or consumed within the coming year or within the normal operating cycle of the business, whichever one is longer, but generally speaking we go with a year. The operating cycle for a typical merchandising or manufacturing company refers to the period of time from the initial outlay of cash for the purchase of inventory until that the time the company collects cash from a customer for the sale of that inventory. Now, some businesses such as shipbuilding or distilleries, well, that operating cycle is going to extend beyond a year because it's going to take more than a year generally to build a ship or even uh, one of these large 777 airplanes. If it takes two years, years to build a super tanker, then the shipbuilder will classify as current assets those that will be converted to cash or consumed within two years. But most businesses um, operating cycle is usually shorter than a year. If it's shorter than a year, then the one-year convention is what we use to classify both assets and liabilities. Where company has no clearly defined operating cycle, then we use that one-year convention. It's common practice for individual current assets to be listed in the order of their liquidity, which is the amount of time it would take to convert that cash to assets. Excuse me, wrong way, the assets to cash. So cash and cash equivalents are cash. Long-term investments, accounts receivable, inventories, and prepaid expenses are all those current assets that generally are going to be converted into cash in a relatively quick time. So here's a look at the current assets section of Nike's balance sheet for the years ended May 31st, 2015 and 14. As you see, cash is absolutely the most liquid current asset and it always gets listed first. Sometimes a portion of the cash could be restricted for a particular use, like to repay debt or to purchase an equipment. So that restricted cash still gets classified as a current asset if it's expected to be used within one year. Otherwise, if that restriction is to be used in over a year, then that gets classified as a long-term asset.
The most liquid asset, cash, always gets listed first. Cash can include cash on hand or cash in banks that's available for use in the operations of the business. And items like bank drafts or cashier's checks and money orders. Cash equivalents frequently include certain negotiable items like commercial paper, money market funds, and U.S. Treasury bills. These are very liquid investments that get converted into cash right away. Most companies do draw a distinction between investments that are classified as cash equivalents and then the next category of current assets, short-term investments, according to the scheduled maturity of the investment. So it's common to classify investments that have a maturity date of three months or less from the date of purchase as a cash equivalent. Cash that's restricted for a special purpose and not available for current operations shouldn't be included in the primary balance of cash and cash equivalents because these restrictions would include future plans to either repay debt or to purchase equipment or make investments. So those restricted cash items is classified as a current asset if it's expected to be used within one year. Otherwise that restricted cash is going to be a long-term asset. Liquid investments not classified as cash equivalents are reported as short-term investments. Sometimes they're called temporary investments or short-term marketable securities. So investments in stock and debt securities of other corporations get included as short-term investments if the company has the ability and the intent to sell those securities within the next 12 months or operating cycle, again, whichever one is longer. Accounts receivable result from the sale of goods or services on credit. Now, accounts receivable often are referred to as trade receivables because they arise in the course of a company's normal trade. Non-trade receivables result from loans or advances by the company to individuals or other entities. When receivables are supported by a formal written agreement or note that specifies payment terms, we then call them notes receivable. Accounts receivable usually are due within 30 to 60 days, depending on the terms offered to customers, but still we count them as current assets. Any receivable, regardless of the source, not expected to be collected within a year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer, gets classified as a long-term asset. In addition, receivables are typically reported at the net amount expected to be collected. So the net amount is calculated as total receivables less an allowance for the estimate of the uncollectible accounts. Inventories for a wholesale or retail company consist of finished goods for sale to customers. So if you buy finished goods like shoes from Nike, potato chips from Costco, or school supplies from Staples, or a new shirt from Gap, that's inventory. Inventories for a manufacturer will include not only the finished goods, but also the goods in the course of production which we call work in process, and goods to be consumed directly or indirectly in production, which are raw materials. Manufacturers usually report all three types of inventory, either directly in the balance sheet or in a disclosure note to the financial statements. Inventories are always reported as current assets because the plan with inventories is to sell them within the current operating cycle. Prepaid expenses represent an asset recorded when it, an expense gets paid in advance. So what that does is it creates a benefit beyond the current period. Examples of prepaids, oftentimes you'll see prepaid rent and prepaid insurance. Now, even though these assets are not converted to cash, they still involve an outlay of cash, if not prepaid. So whether 
A prepaid expense is current or non-current really depends on when we're going to see the benefit. So if rent on an office building was prepaid for one year, then the entire prepayment gets classified as a current asset. But if rent is prepaid for an extending period beyond the coming year, a portion of that prepayment technically is classified as a long-term asset. Nike includes prepaid expenses along with other current assets. Now other current assets also could include assets like non-trade receivables that because their amount are not material didn't necessarily need a separate disclosure. Let's look at a question. So current assets include cash and all other assets expected to become cash or be consumed A within one year, B within one operating cycle, C within one year or one operating cycle whichever is shorter, or D within one year or operating cycle whichever is longer. Hope you got this one. <coughs> It's D. Remember, the criteria used to classify an asset as current is whether the asset's going to be consumed or converted within one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. Most companies, one year is going to be longer than the operating cycle, but we know there are companies like ships and airplanes where when assets are expected to provide economic benefits beyond the next year or operating cycle, then they get reported as long-term or sometimes we call non-current assets. Long-term assets then get further classified into investments, property plant and equipment, intangible assets, and other assets. So consider the non-current assets section of Nike's balance sheet for the years ended May 31st 2015 and February 3rd, 2014, we see that long-term assets include property, plant, equipment, identifiable and tangible assets, goodwill, deferred income taxes, along with other assets. Let me push this down so you can see it clear. Now, investments are assets that are not used directly in the operations of a business. These assets would include investments in equity and debt securities of other businesses or corporations. They could include land held for speculation or long-term receivables or also cash to be set aside for special purposes like future plant expansion. Now these assets are classified as long-term because management doesn't intend to convert these assets into cash in the next year or in the operating cycle, whichever one is longer. Tangible, which means physically, physical long-lived assets used in the operations of a business are classified as property, plant, and equipment. Now PP&E along with intangible assets often are the primary revenue generating assets of the business. Property, plant, and equipment include includes land or buildings, equipment, machinery, furniture. It could include natural resources like mineral mines, timber tracks, oil wells. These various assets generally are reported as a single amount in the balance sheet with details provided in the notes. They are reported at original cost less any accumulated depreciation or if it's natural resources depletion or if it's intangibles then they're going to be amortization. Very often companies will report only the net amount of property, plant, and equipment in the balance sheet and then just give you the details in a disclosure note. Land often is listed as a separate item in the classification because land is the only thing that has an unlimited useful life 
and because of that unlimited useful life doesn't get depreciated. Some assets used in the operations of a business don't have a physical substance. These are called intangible assets. Generally, these represent the ownership of an exclusive right to something like a product or a process, a name that can be a valuable resource in generating future revenues. Patents, copyrights, franchises, and trademarks are some examples. They're generally reported in the balance sheet at their purchase price less any accumulated amortization. Not all intang intangible assets are purchased. Some of those do get in developed internally, like instead of purchasing a patent granting an exclusive right to manufacture a drug, a pharmaceutical company might spend a lot of time in research and development to discover the drug and obtain a patent on its own. Another common type of, type of intangible assets, goodwill. Goodwill isn't associated with any specific identifiable right, but it arises when one company purchases another company. The amount reported for goodwill equals the acquisition price that's above the fair value of all the identifiable net assets that get acquired from that new company. Balance sheets often include a catch-all classification of long-term assets called other assets. So this classification includes long-term prepaid expenses or deferred charges and any long-term asset not included in one of those other classifications. So for example, if a company's long-term investments are not material in amount, then they might get lumped into this other class asset classification rather than including them in a separate category. A key to understanding which category an asset is reported is management's intent. So management may intend to use land for long-term operating purposes like PP&E or they could hold it for future resale which would be then an investment or they could sell it in its ordinary course of business. So if it was an investment or real estate company then that might be an inventory item on that company's balance sheet. So buildings are generally more likely to provide economic benefits beyond the next year or operating cycle. Kind of gave you a little hint here. Which of the following is most likely to be reported as a long-term asset? Well, accounts receivable we know we plan on getting that money in the current year. Prepaid rent is going to be used up within the current year. And inventories, the plan is to have those inventories on hand so we can sell them in the current year. So building is the correct answer here. Because generally they are going to provide a future benefit. So which of the following represents tangible, long-lived assets? That is PP&E. They're long-term assets that are used in normal business operations. Remember, current assets only provide an economic benefit for this current period. Investments aren't really used for primary business operations. And intangible assets don't have a physical substance. They're not tangible. We've seen how assets get grouped into current and long-term categories and that long-term assets always are subclassified further. Now let's take a look at liabilities. These also get separated into current and long-term categories. So liabilities represent obligations to other entities. By classifying them as current liabilities and long-term liabilities, the information value of reporting these amounts gets enhanced. The liability section of Nike's balance sheet is shown here on the slide. You see it's accrued liabilities 
include accrued compensation, accrued rent, accrued taxes, accrued interest. Information such as Nike's accrued taxes came from the notes to the financials. The company classifies the current portion of its long-term debt as a current liability. And the reason it needs to do that is because that portion of its long-term debt is due in the current year or current operating cycle. Current liabilities are those obligations that are expected to be satisfied through the use of current assets or the creation of other current liabilities. This classification includes all liabilities that are, to, that are expected to get satisfied within one year or the current operating cycle. Again, whichever is longer. You're going to get tired of hearing that one from me. An exception is a liability that management intends to refinance on a long-term basis. So if management intends to refinance a six-month note payable by substituting a two-year note payable, and it has the ability to do so, then that liability is not going to be classified as current, even though it's due in the coming year. Current liabilities usually include accounts payable, notes payable for just short-term borrowings, deferred revenues, which we know sometimes as unearned revenues, monies that have been collected in advance that we need to do something with, accrued liabilities, and the current maturing portion of long-term debt. So accounts payable are obligations to suppliers of merchandise or of services purchased on open account that's usually due within 30 or 60 days. Notes payable are written promises to pay cash at some future date. So notes, unlike accounts payable, usually require a payment of interest in addition to just meeting that obligation amount, the balance. Notes maturing in the next year or operating cycle will get classified as current liabilities. Deferred revenues sometimes, as I said, called unearned revenues, represent cash received from a customer for goods or services that get provided in a future period. An example would be the purchase of a gift card. Companies record deferred revenue when they sell gift cards, and then they wait to record the revenue until the cards are redeemed or they expire. Accrued liabilities represent obligations created when expenses have been incurred but will not be paid until a subsequent reporting period. Examples include accrued salaries payable, accrued interest payable, and accrued taxes payable. Long-term notes, loans, mortgages, and bonds payable are reclassified and usually reported as current liabilities when they become payable within the next year or operating cycle, if that's longer. In the same way, when long-term debt is payable in installments, the installment payable currently gets reported as a current liability. In this example, if a, hundred, if a $1 million note payable that requires $100,000 in principal payments to be made in each of the next 10 years is classified as a $100,000 current liability and the rest, the $900,000 that's going to be paid over this current year, will be a long-term liability. Long-term liabilities are obligations that aren't going to get satisfied in the next year or operating cycle. They do not require the use of current assets or the creation of current liabilities for payment. These can include long-term notes and bonds and pension obligations and lease obligations. Simply classifying a long liability as long-term doesn't really provide a lot of complete information to people who need this for decision making. 
Like long term could mean anything from two to 20 or 30 or 40 years. Payment terms, interest rates, and other details needed to help understand the impact of these obligations on future cash flows and potential long-term solvency are going to be recorded in disclosure notes to the financial statements. Let's take a look at this next question. The key distinction between current liabilities and long-term liabilities is A, the amount of the obligation to be satisfied, large versus small. Ah. To whom the obligation is owed, those inside versus those outside the company. Mm. The length of time until the obligation is expected to be satisfied, less than one year versus more than one year operating cycle, if it's longer. That sounds good. Or D, the nature of the obligation, determinable amount versus estimated amount. Mm. So, as you can tell from my sounds, the correct answer is C. Liabilities get classified as current when the obligation is expected to be satisfied within one year or the operating cycle. And liabilities get classified as long-term when the obligation is expected to be satisfied in more than one year or operating cycle. Now, owner's equity is simply the residual amount derived from subtracting liabilities from assets. For that reason, it's sometimes referred to as net assets or book value. We know that owners of a corporation are its shareholders. And owner's equity for a corporation is referred to as shareholder's equity or sometimes stockholder's equity. Now, shareholder's equity for a corporation arises primarily from two sources, paid in capital and retained earnings. Paid in capital is the amount that shareholders have invested in the company. It usually arises when the company issues stock. Now, information about the number of shares the company is authorized and how many shares have been issued and are outstanding must be disclosed either directly in the balance sheet or in a disclosure note. Retained earnings represents the accumulated net income reported since the inception of a corporation, but not yet paid to the shareholders as dividends. In addition to paid in capital and retained earnings, shareholders' equity may include a few other equity components, such as accumulated other comprehensive income, which we'll call AOCI, Comprehensive income refers to the total change in stockholders' equity other than transactions with owners. While most of this change is reported in the income statement as net income, there are some items of other comprehensive income not reported in the income statement. We accumulate these items in the accumulated other comprehensive income account just like we accumulate each year's net income in the retained earnings account. So this slide presents the shareholders equity section of Nike's balance sheets. From the inception of the corporation through May 31st of 2015, Nike's accumulated net income less dividends of 4.4,604,600 which gets reported in the retained earnings. The company's paid in capital is represented by common stock and additional paid in capital, which collectively represents cash invested by shareholders in exchange for ownership interests. Information about number of shares the company's authorized, issued, and are outstanding must get disclosed. Let's look at an example um, exercise in the back of the chapter 3-4. So the following is a December 31st year one post-closing trial balance for Etude Corporation. What our job is from this information 
is to prepare a classified balance sheet. So we know we're going to utilize the permanent accounts in order to create that classified balance sheet. We'll also need to um, be aware of separating them into the appropriate categories. So first of all, in a classified balance sheet, on the left hand side will be assets. We're going to break those into current assets, again those that are going to be converted to cash within the current year or operating <coughs> cycle. Cash is the first since it's the most liquid. Then from there, <coughs> excuse me, for we have marketable securities, accounts receivable, inventories, prepaid rent, all of these the plan is that they are going to be converted into cash or used as cash within the current year. So we total these total current assets 188, 125. Next we have the next long-term asset category property, plant, and equipment where we place the machinery. We make sure we include the contra account accumulated depreciation because this will always get recorded at net. Next are intangibles, our patent. We then show our total assets in a summary. On the other side, we start with our current liabilities, accounts payable, wages payable, and taxes payable all due within the current year. Then we do go with our long-term liabilities. Our bonds are due in 10 years. So we total our liabilities and next we use our shareholders equity section which is our paid in capital of common stock plus our retained earnings gives us our total shareholders equity section. We total our liabilities and shareholders equity section and boy, we better get 421400 which is equal to the assets. Next, let's take a look at 3-6. Again, here are the ending balances of Core Instruments Corporation. Here you see various permanent accounts along with temporary accounts. It then gives us some additional information we need to look at. The note receivable along with any accrued interest is due on November 22nd of year 2. The note payable is due in year 4. Interest is payable annually. The marketable securities consist of treasury bills, all of which will mature in the next year. And then deferred revenue will be recognized as revenue equally over the next two years. Now they're giving us this information to help us determine is it going to be current or would it be long term. We are to determine the company's working capital, which would be current assets minus current liabilities. So as you see here, we've got to determine what are the current assets. Well, we know cash is, accounts receivable, raw materials. The note receivable is due on November 22nd year 2 which is letting us know it's a current asset. So we've got our cash, our accounts, our raw materials, and our note receivable. Now the interest receivable it tells us the note, note receivable along with any accrued interest is due. So we know our interest is receivable is also going to be received within the current period. Our marketable securities, they tell us they consist of treasury bills which are going to be due in the next year. So that's giving us a hint it is also going to be current. Our inventory will always be um, current assets. We've got a couple types of inventory here, work in process, 
and finished goods along with raw materials would be basically part of inventory. They tell us that the prepaid rent, that one half of that 66500 is going to be used within the next period, or this current coming period, for the next two years. So we get to take that portion of prepaid rent, which is going to be utilized within the next year. So, if we take our assets, which we know are always current, our receivables, our inventory, it's letting us know the note receivable is current, along with the interest receivable, and then the marketable securities, we learned what was in them, and they're current. Other inventory, work in process, finished goods, along with our prepaid rent, half of it, because that prepaid is going to cover two years. So we're only taking that prepaid rent for the next year. It gives us our total of current assets of $513,950. Now we're going to need to do the same with our current liabilities. We know that the interest payable, the note payable is doing year four, but the interest is payable annually. So we know we're going to have to pay that in the current year. It tells us our deferred revenues are going to be recognized equally over the next two years. So half of it's current, the other half will be long term. The accounts payable will always be current. So our current liabilities consist of our interest payable, half of the deferred revenues, and total our accounts payable. The difference between our current assets and our current liabilities is termed working capital. That's what we have available above and beyond our current liabilities we know that are going to be due within this next year. Let's take a look at exercise 3-7. The following balance sheet for the Triffitt Corporation was prepared by a recently hired accountant. There are a couple errors in this statement. We also have some additional information. Cash includes a 21,050 restricted amount to be used for repayment of the bonds payable in year 10. So that's letting us know that's not really current, that 21,000. We're not going to use that money until year 10. Cost of the machinery is 148.7. Accounts receivable includes a $19,000 note receivable from a customer due in year nine. So we're showing current assets greater than really what they should be. The note payable includes accrued interest of 48.46. Principal and interest are both due on February 1st, year seven. It's really important that we keep our note payable, the balance of the note, separate from any accrued interest. That should be recorded separately. The company began operations in year one. Income less dividends since inception of the company. Totals 69,567. And then 46,000 shares of no par common stock were issued in year one but 92,000 shares are authorized. So we've got to take this information from what we've been given and adjust and make a new classified balance sheet. So as you see here, we've got all this different information and we're going to create a new balance sheet. Now our cash includes a 21,050 restricted amount to be used for a payment. So really, that 21,000 should be shown of the bonds payable in year 10. We should show that 21,000 
as an investment because it's really not allowed to be used in the current period. So as you see here, we have separated that amount as an investment. We're holding that money for a future purpose. The cost of machinery is 148700 Accounts receivable included a long-term, a note payable. Let me see what I'm, the note, oh. Accounts receivable included a $19,000 note receivable. We need to separate that out. Notes receivable are separated because that usually involves a written promissory note with interest that's payable in addition to the amount that will be due with the note payable. So you see here, we've changed it showing just the cash that's available. Our accounts receivable we've netted. We've taken out the notes receivable from it. And moving on here, the inventories stayed the same. The machinery was adjusted because we needed to show less the accumulated depreciation. So we want to show that machinery at what we purchased it for and then show the accumulated depreciation to come up with the net amount. The intangible assets of 328 are shown net. So as you see here, in the original the assets were going to be, um, excuse me, at 323900 As we've adjusted this, the total assets are 319150 Now, on the liabilities and shareholders' equity side, our accounts payable stay the same, but we do add a separate amount in current liabilities for the interest payable that is due this coming year. The note payable is also due this coming year, but we separated out the interest from the note to come up with our total current liabilities. Then our bonds payable we show. Next our shareholders equity section we show the retained earnings and we show the common stock portion. So the 104,350 is our total shareholders equity section, but we need to break it down between the paid in capital plus our retained earnings. So as you see here, even though someone can create a financial statement such as a balance sheet, it doesn't necessarily mean they are recording everything where it should be recorded.